All right, guys, in this video, we're going to walk through a sample AP Physics 2 question from the College Board, and this is a publicly released question. This comes from Unit 3, which is like electric fields, electric forces, and electric potentials. So, and this is this is a publicly released question. So we get a, I guess, a distribution of charges. We've got a positive charge up here, uh, plus capital Q, and a negative charge down here, and another little positive charge down right here. So it says three electric charges are arranged on an XY coordinate system as shown above. Express all algebraic answers to the following parts in terms of positive Q, or sorry, capital Q, lowercase q, x, d, and any fundamental constants. d is the distance that positive Q is from our x-axis, and the negative Q is below our x-axis, and x represents how far away this tiny little positive Q is from our origin. So on the diagram, draw vectors representing the forces F1 and F2 exerted on the lowercase q charge by the uppercase positive q charge and the negative uppercase q charges, respectively. So if this is a positive charge and this is a positive charge, electrically they're both going to repel one another, so this tiny little positive q charge feels a push away, directly away from that positive q charge. And this charge down here is negative, and so this little positive charge here is going to feel attracted to that negative charge. Well, they'll both feel attracted to one another, but the direction that the positive Q charge feels a force will be directly towards that, so that will be F2 right there. Part B asks, or asks you to determine the magnitude and direction of the total electric force on that little positive Q charge. So we have the two forces. We're assuming gravitational effects are negligible, so we're only considering the electrostatic forces. So how do we figure out both the direction and the size or the magnitude of the net electric force in this little positive 2q charge? Well, remember, if you don't have forces that are um, parallel with one another, you can't just add and subtract the sizes of these two forces. We have to kind of think about things in terms of two-dimensional vectors. So F1 is pushing on that positive Q charge both to the right and down, so it's got a, a horizontal component and a vertical component right there. And this F2, the attractive force from that negative Q charge, is pulling both um, left and down, and so it has a left component and a vertical down component. So when we add these two forces together, we've got to think about adding their components. So uh, remember that, well, force 1 and force 2 are actually going to be the same size. These two forces are identical in size because um, these two positive charges have the same amount of charge um, in coulombs. They're separated by a certain distance. We're going to call that R. And uh, this negative Q has the same amount of charge as this positive Q, and it's at the same distance. And so the attractive force from that negative Q will be as big as a repulsive force from that positive Q. Um, and if these two forces are the same size, and um, the angle, these the angle that these forces are from vertical are the same, and they would be because they're the same distance away vertically and horizontally from that little positive Q, then the horizontal components of those two forces are actually going to cancel, one's to the right and one's to the left. And they both have a vertical component of the force, and so if the horizontal components cancel, if we're adding up all the electrostatic forces on that little positive Q charge, it's going to be the sum of the vertical component from force 1 and the vertical component from force 2, or F2 sub y. And again, if these angles are the same, and the hypotenuse, the size of these electrostatic forces are the same, that means not only will the horizontal components be the same size, but the vertical components will also be the same size. So we could find out the sum of the electrostatic forces if we find out we just multiply one of the y components times two because they're the same size. So knowing all of that, let's now see if we can get an expression for the size of that force. So the sum of the electrostatic forces is equal to two times the y component of one of those forces. And if we look at, let's say, force 1, the force that's both down and to the right, we need to figure out if we know F1 or we can get an expression for F1, 
how big is the y component relative to that well if I'm calling that angle theta right there that means there's theta inside of our little right triangle the y component will just be the hypotenuse times the cosine of theta right there if you chose this to be theta that would be f1 times the sine of theta but I chose this one to be theta so the y component will be the force times the cosine of theta so if we come back here <clears throat> if we want twice the size of the y component of one of the electric forces it's going to be two times f1 cosine theta or it could be two times f2 cosine theta so how big is the electrostatic force bit, um, for the force that the positive charge exerts in a little q well we have to go back to coulomb's law it's going to be coulomb's constant or one over four pi epsilon naught or we could just say k times the amount of charge on each of those things so we're talking about the amount of charging coulombs on the capital Q and the amount of charging coulombs on the lowercase Q so that's just capital Q and lowercase Q divided by the distance those things are separated squared so that's divided by R squared we're defining R as the separation distance between the two charges and remember well look this is just the hypotenuse of this right triangle so if we want to figure out the size of the hypotenuse we can use the Pythagorean theorem so a squared plus b squared equals c squared or x squared plus d squared equals r squared so r is going to be the square root of x squared plus d squared that's just using the Pythagorean theorem so in our expression rather than an r since that's not one of the allowed variables we're allowed right here we put the square root of x squared plus d squared that is r and we have to square that expression so it's 2 times the electrostatic force that's the real force and we're multiplying by the cosine of theta to get the y component of that force well <clears throat> um, what's an expression that we can use for the cosine of theta well, let's kind of go back up here to this uh, the diagram right here so if this is theta what's the cosine of theta well remember um, little trigonometric equation the cosine of an angle is equal to the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse the length of the adjacent side divided by the length of the hypotenuse well if we look at this little right triangle right here the adjacent side is d and the hypotenuse is the square root of x squared plus d squared so the cosine of theta is equal to adjacent which is d divided by this there we go there's the adjacent side that's d divided by the square root of x squared plus d squared which is just r that's the hypotenuse and so we get two times the electrostatic force between the two charges times the cosine of theta and so we get this right here and if we just kind of group these things together in the numerator we've got two times k times capital Q plus times lowercase q times d divided by x squared plus d squared and I'm just like if we squared the square root of something it's just that thing um, but in the cosine of theta term again in the denominator we have another square root of x squared plus d squared so if we get x squared plus d squared that quantity times the square root of that quantity that just simplifies to this <clears throat> it's x squared plus d squared uh, to the one half power or three divided by two okay so that's these two things combined just simplified to go like there um, it's asking remember though this expression is the size of the net electric force but we also need to identify the direction of that net electric force and if we look back up here those two y components are pointing down in the negative y direction so to get the full points for this you have to make sure to say that this size force is either pointing down or you can just say it's in the negative y direction Part C asks to determine the electric field, both magnitude and direction, at the position of the positive Q charge due to the other two charges. Well, if we know the size of the electrostatic force, it's pretty easy to, or an expression for that, it's pretty easy to figure out something for the size and direction of the electric field strength. Because the electric field strength, both size and direction, is equal to the size and direction of the electric force divided by Q. Now, what is Q? let's go right here um, the electric the electric field at this location in space is we can find out the strength of it 
if we basically know these two things about that position? Well, in order to figure out if there is an electric field, let you know we'd have to put a we'd have to put a charge there and then measure the size of the force that it feels and divide that by the amount of charge we put at that location. So at that location, you know, we've got the size of the net force at that location. So to figure out the strength of the electric field on that specific charge or at that specific location that's causing this the specific size electric force, we have to divide by the charge at that location. So that's divided by little positive Q. So we just take our expression for the size or magnitude of the electric force, which is this, came from the previous part, and all we do is have to divide by lowercase q. And notice there's a lowercase q on the, in the numerator and denominator, so that can cancel out. And so our expression looks awful similar. We're just, it just doesn't have a little lowercase q in the numerator. So this is the size of the electric field at that location, regardless of whatever, we, whatever charge you place at that location right there. So that's the strength in uh, newtons per coulomb. And I don't have it written here, but uh, that would also be pointed down because the electric field strength will always be in the same direction of the net electric force felt on a positive charge. So the electric field would be pointed in the negative y direction. The next question, uh, part D, says to calculate the electric potential at the position of the positive Q charge due to the other two charges. So if we go back up to our diagram, um, whether this little positive Q charge is here or not, um, there will be an electric potential, a total electric potential at that point in units um, of joules per coulomb or volts that's created by that positive charge and that negative charge. Um, if just this positive charge was here in space, um, it would create a positive electric potential in you know the space around it. And so over here, it's going to create a positive electric potential. If the negative charge was here all by itself, um, negative charges create negative electric potentials. Um, it's going to create a negative electric potential at that location. Well, what's true of the actual electric potential if both of these things are are here in space? Well, um, electric potentials uh, are not vector quantities, uh, so they don't have a direction. <clears throat> they do have a sign, um, but they don't have a direction. So uh, it's either positive or negative. So if you want to figure out what the net electric potential is, you just add up the two electric potentials. You don't have to go through all of this vector stuff like you do with electric fields. You just add up the positive and negative values and the simple sum will be the net electric potential at that point. Well, here's the equation that we have for the electric potential or V created by a single charge. So that's uh, 1 over 5, 4 pi epsilon naught, which is just that Coulomb's constant again, times the charge producing the electric potential divided by the distance uh, you are away from that charge. And so in the equation, it's a lowercase q, but if we look up in our diagram, the two things producing the electric potentials, you know, at some radial distance r, and it's going to be the same radial distance, is positive q and negative q, and it's those um, uppercase variables. So we'll call v1 the electric potential produced by the positive charge, V2, the electric potential produced by the negative Q charge. And so it's just K, Q over R. There's positive Q. Uh, so this will be the expression for the electric potential at a specific distance. We'll call that R away from this positive Q charge. Uh, and we're adding to that the electric potential created by the negative Q, Q charge. The only difference is they have the same charge amount the same radial distance and k is a constant. They just have a different sign. And so the positive charge will create the same size electric potential as the negative charge. And since they have opposite signs, the sum of those two things are just zero like that. The last part of this question uh, is this part E. It says charge Q 
positive Q is now moved along the positive x-axis to a very large distance from the other two charges. It says the magnitude of the force on the lowercase positive charge, Q charge, at this large distance now varies as 1 over x cubed. It says explain why this happens. Let me just bring the diagram back up real quick. So in this diagram, notice like D and X, they're not that much different. You Obviously X is a little bit bigger, but they're saying, what if we took this positive Q charge and we now like moved it to a very, very, very far distance um, over to the right? How does that change the expression that we find for the size of the electric force? Well, <clears throat> um, you know, D and X are relatively close in size, but as X continues to get farther and farther and farther away, the size of x compared to the size of d is much, much larger. That basically makes d an insignificant uh, size compared to a really, really large x. So this is kind of uh, what it's asking you to do. Like, What happens when x is very large? Well, if we look back to our expression for, since we're talking about the magnitude of the net force that it feels, like this is the expression we figured out to, to find that quantity. The question is like, how does this denominator here change um, as x gets really, really big? So, because it's asking like, why does it vary as 1 over x cubed? Like, notice there's like no d's in the denominator right there. Well, essentially, this, this expression right here, the square root of x squared plus d squared, that's like r, essentially, right? And as x gets really, really big, like the value of this quantity essentially approaches x because the radial distance, which is this, is the farther and farther you get, the radial distance closely approximate the size of like whatever x actually is. So if uh, this essentially becomes x at really, really large x distances, that means we can take our expression for the size of the electric force, and instead of the square root of x squared plus d squared, we can just plug in an x, right? And so, well, um, this right here, I'm just kind of like rearranging this to make it a little bit easier. So remember we said x squared plus d squared to the 3 halves power. That's the same thing as the square root of x squared plus d squared cubed, or to the third power. And this is essentially x. And so if we turn that into x, notice our equation, we just have an x cubed on the bottom, right? And so for very large distances where x is very large, this expression gives us how big the size of the net electric force is on that tiny little positive Q charge. Uh, and we can see that the electrostatic force or the net electrostatic force for this charge distribution is proportional to 1 over x cubed.